yeah, welcome to Baywatching. In case you didn't catch on, this is gonna be all Baywatch all the time. For the uninitiated, Baywatch follows the lives of, well, Baywatch, a team of lifeguards in Los Angeles County. The cast is constantly rotating, but the main presence on the show is Mitch Buchanan, played by David Hasselhoff, who is one of only three characters to be present in every season but one. Despite this show airing through much of my childhood, I didn't actually sit down and watch it to my recollection. At best, I caught it channel surfing, which I guess fits since this is a beach show. I never once understood the appeal of the program, so it stayed under my radar. Also, it ended when I was 11 and I was probably playing with Barbies at the time. And this may shock all of you, but Baywatch is in the Guinness Book of World Records as the most watched show of all time, adding up to 1.1 billion viewers. It's aired in 148 countries and has been translated into 44 different languages. It went on for 11 seasons, two seasons of the spin-off Baywatch Nights, plus two TV movies, totaling 286 episodes and just over 217 hours of television. And I say this as the highest compliment I can give, it is the dumbest show I have ever had the pleasure to watch. I was but a fool until this day. I feel like my life has been wasted, and now that I've discovered Baywatch, nights will never be the same. Every single damn trope and cliché on television was used and perfected by Baywatch, from being completely silly to downright offensive. It is a wonderful program that I am continually amazed and baffled by, and since I am both a masochist and someone of poor taste, I have decided to explore every single episode. Join me, won't you? Like most shows at the time, Baywatch began with a pilot movie, Panic at Malibu Pier. And with a strong opening like this, it's easy to see why the show succeeded. Well, alright, uh, what a start. This was a time in history when the internet was used by academics and nerds, therefore porn wasn't as widespread and freely available. Thus, preteen boys had to settle for National Geographic educational boob or a side boob on the television. And what Baywatch lacked in effort or talent, it more than made up for in lots and lots of slow motion boobs. It pretty much showed as much as it could without actually taking clothes off, and the pilot is, oh hey, there's some boobs. Yeah, the show infamous for porn without porn started out with a TV movie that actually showed nudity. But don't worry, these characters are only in this shot, have no lines, and are never seen again, thus making it easy to cut this out for television. But hot damn, kids are gonna rent the hell out of this! Time for that sweet, sweet Baywatch theme. If it isn't evident already, Baywatch took a little bit of time to fall into its niche, and season one is a lot different from the others. Not that there isn't plenty of stupid, but they hadn't quite figured out that magical formula that made Baywatch the cultural phenomenon it eventually became. And really, half of the appeal of Baywatch was the catchy theme song, making season one even more bizarro. How else will we know that they'll be ready? Forever and always, they're always here. Not that it really matters for the DVD releases, the music is all sorts of messed up. In another shocking revelation, only one country has released all 11 seasons on DVD and as they originally aired. Can you guess where that is? Ula Hasselhoff! The Fiora shall lead us out of the darkness and into the light! You'll also notice that the intro features exactly one dude actually doing any lifeguarding, while the main cast members run in slow motion along the beach. This wasn't an attempt to protect the Hoff's flawless hairdo, but in reality, the actors are not actually trained lifeguards. Shocker, I know. There is one exception in the hero of the series, Numi. Numi is the single greatest Baywatch character, and I will fight you if you say otherwise. Numi is short for Michael Newman, played by Michael Newman. He was a lifeguard for 20 years before joining the crew of Baywatch as a technical consultant, aka make us look like we know what we're doing. He was also buddies with Greg Bonin, another lifeguard and one of the show's creators. 
He was promoted to a supporting character and stayed on the program just as long as Hasselhoff. Despite doing very little that's actually notable on the show for an extremely long time, he is amazing. Alongside being a lifeguard, he was also a firefighter, nowadays turned real estate salesman. In 1996, he won the National Ironman Championship. He appeared in a couple of infomercials for the New Wave Oven and has a magnificent mustache. There was an official New Me fan club at one point, people, but that should come as no surprise to you. A lot of the rescues on the show were reenactments of real-life rescues Numi was a part of. For real, there are people alive nowadays because of Numi. A salute to you, Numi, you magnificent man. Anyway, right, time to talk about the fictional lifeguards. We open with Mitch, Hobie, and Jill. You already know Mitch. Hobie is his unfortunately named son, played by the kid from Step by Step, and Jill is a fellow lifeguard who will hold your attention for approximately two seconds. The three of them are in a competition, and if there's one thing Mitch loves, it's making other people lose. Winner! I am winner! No woman can beat the Hoff! What's this, huh? Haven't worked out in a while? There's nothing there to pinch. Leave me alone. Oh, yeah. Nothing a little lieutenant's uniform won't hide. If you can find one to fit your first day on the job. Uh. Exposition coupled with a nonsensical fat joke. We're on a roll! Mitch Frankenstein groans in protest. Uh. Anyway, as indicated in that very natural dialogue, Mitch has been promoted to lieutenant at Baywatch headquarters, which involves a lot of paperwork, planning, and wearing a chip's uniform. Hey Jill, winner. Showed her! <laughs> Winning is the only thing that matters, Hobie. Who names their kid Hobie? Seriously. Mitch, you're a terrible dad. I took the liberty of looking it up because I couldn't believe it was a real name. Here's the scoop, guys. It's a variation of the name Hobart, which sounds equally fake and doubly stupid, which makes me wish that's what Mitch had gone with. But upon further investigation, I discovered Hobart is an American variation of the name Hubert. And want to guess what country that originates in? Damn right it's Germany! Mitch, you clever bastard! Anyway, if you love creepy sexualization of underage children, you will love Hobie's subplot. And she said, Hobie, would you please rub some oil on my back? Ooh. What'd you do? <laughs> I told her I couldn't get my hands greasy because I'd surf ski later. Why'd you do that? Why didn't you take her home and show her a good time? Hobie the Magnificent embarrassed? Give me a break. <laughs> Hobie the Magnificent. Good one, Mitch. Here's some more of our season one cast. Craig Pomeroy, lawyer by day, lifeguard by day also. Check out the sweet car phone. His story is deciding which profession he should go into. Years of schooling, a bajillion dollars of debt, not to mention a sweet paycheck. Nope, lifeguarding for peanuts it is. He can't resist the call of the waves. Then there's Eddie Kramer, man with a penchant for midriff shirts and the weeniest character on the show. He's property of the Philadelphia Eagles. His character is 18. <laughs> okay, Baywatch, sure he is. The actor was only 10 years older than that, close enough. Also, the guy's stage name is Billy Warlock, a fantastic moniker that he can't possibly live up to. Eddie's gotten in trouble with the law and is getting a fresh start with the Baywatch crew. In the Barbie Jeep, we have Shawnee McLean, another new lifeguard who knows Eddie from rookie school. Like many of the Baywatch women, she's played by a former Playboy playmate, this time Erica Liniak. Or as I have dubbed her, not Christy Swanson. Shawnee's family is rich or something. Despite the show being famous for being more 90s than the 90s itself, you can especially see that it started in 1989 in Shawnee's fashion. I mean, I know you came in number one, so you got to pick Baywatch, but I came in 46. I don't know how I got it. Trust me, her acting improves. In the previously mentioned topless scene, we get these dudes checking the woman out with Numi in the middle. Hey, I'm in front of you! Numi, you magnificent dick. Hey, you know, I wonder if she's violating the nudity ordinance. As long as we mention it, it's okay! In addition to the slow-motion boob action, one of the contributing factors to this show's success was the casting of David Hasselhoff in his first TV venture since the very successful Knight Rider series. So, of course, the main focus of the pilot movie is on Craig, his lifeguard-slash-lawyer pal. And here's a woman in a Jiffy Pop space sweater. Don't ask me. Oh no, her fanny pack's gonna weigh her down! Craig, who is suddenly in another dimension, spots her falling and rushes in to help. Oh, it's alright. Her sweater acts as a flotation device. Good job, costume department! After Craig saves Jiffy Pop's life, she becomes obsessed with him, perhaps because she needs someone to inflate her shirts. I believe in fate. Do you? Fate? 
Nah. Anyway, landmark moment. 25 minutes in, 1989 audiences were treated to the first ever Baywatch montage. As we journey through them, we'll laugh, cry, masturbate, and sleep, mostly sleep, to the jammingest tunes of the time. If you're unfamiliar with the show's formula, know this. There's a main plot, one or several meanwhiles, there's always a meanwhile, and any time left will be filled with montages and slow motion. Look at B footage from the intro sequence. See men in neon shorts carrying coolers. Possibly enjoy shots of butts for the thongs right all the way up to the waist. Witness one of 10,000 shots of Numi diving off of a boat. Watch as lifeguards spin the rescue cans for no particular reason. Sigh as lifeguards and shades run towards something just off screen. And if you didn't like this montage, don't worry. We get another one 10 minutes later. Nice Mr. Rogers sweater there, Mitch. And here's Captain Dawn. Boy, do I not care about Captain Dawn. Theoretically, he's there to give Mitch a hard time because he's his boss and that's what bosses do, but really, he's just sort of there. Meanwhile, Jill is supposed to be Shawnee's mentor, but Shawnee is distracted by boys, all while Jill is trying desperately to have a character trait. Meanwhile, I totally forgot to introduce Season 1's best character, Trevor Cole. He's an arrogant but incompetent Australian lifeguard who works for a private beach club and is, again theoretically, meant to be an antagonist for our heroes. You'll notice the show seems to love this oddly specific character type, as every once in a while a new Australian arrogant and incompetent character will show up. Okay. Trevor Cole, shark fighter and virgin converter. I've lost one or two fights, but uh, only to the sharks. Now back home in Australia, my face is on cereal boxes. I can give you an autograph one for you if you like. Don't eat cereal. You showed him, Mitch. So wait, he just walks around with cards that say he's a shark fighter and virgin converter? That's elaborately stupid. And he's so famous he's on cereal boxes, but he came to America to lifeguard for some reason? Are American lifeguards hot shit now? Trevor Cole, the greatest Baywatch Season 1 character. Meanwhile, Eddie is trying to get a child to do his job for him. Lifeguarding isn't as easy as it looks, kid. I'll show you. By the time I was six, I had three moms and dads. How? Well, let's just say my last name is Foster. Forget it. Look, Eddie, the kid's not interested in your personal problems. He's six. That's probably why he didn't get your clever foster family joke. I get it. What an idiot! <laughs> Holy music cue, Batman! A riptide comes in, and the crew must rescue multiple victims at once. Mitch runs over several pedestrians on the way over. I'll be damned if those sons of bitches steal my saves from me! While this rescue is going on, Australian but incompetent ignores the people closest to him to save an attractive lady. Oh, Trevor, when will you Australians learn? You step out of line one more time. You got me to answer to. Mate. Ooh, that'll put a shrimp on the bobby! Oh, oh no, no, no fringe coming out of the butt. That's... that's just unfortunate. Now is the perfect opportunity for Trevor to make his move. What are these? <laughs> An old Aussie brew. An old Aussie brew? Oh man, bringing in the old country. Australia is as confusing as it is mysterious. Hey Trevor, how'd you magically save 60 people in one day? Ancient Aussie secret. But Trevor's not the only one getting some action today. Here's an incredibly uncomfortable scene of Hobie undoing a girl's top. Creepy underage sexual tension. I'll get Chelsea. Oh, thanks, Brian. Damn you and your rippling muscles, Brian! Well, you know, I guess we're supposed to be in suspense as to who's going to have sex with her. In subplot number 703, Mitch's ex-wife Gail, played by Wendy Malick, wants Hobie to come live with her in the city. This is an issue because she's part box. Look, Mitch, this is just not working. What's not working? A divorce? 
<laughs> I'm such a jokester. But seriously, if you want to get back together, I'm not like opposed to it. I mean, when you life's a beach, why should he ever want to leave? You left. Oh, you just got mitched. I particularly love the portrayal of Mitch as five years old in this. He gets all pissy about the cereal thing, he tries to outclimb Australian but incompetent, and he's always got to get the last word in. I don't think he even wants Hobie, he just doesn't want to lose. Back on the Craig front, Jiffy Pop shows up in his tower to seduce him. Craig defuses the situation by acting really strange and slow. Drinking's not allowed on the beach. So naturally, when a girl is stealing your stuff, breaking into your tower, writing poetry about you, and following you around everywhere, the best thing to do is to tell her about your wife. You know, instead of, like, calling the police or having common sense. Lori, put that back on. Young lady. And in subplot number 305, we have lifeguard Day Before Retirement, who is old. He will live a long and happy life. Captain Don doesn't think he's up for lifeguarding anymore, since he's near mandatory retirement age. So Mitch has to keep him off the beach until then. Since he's like a father to Mitch, we know he will retire peacefully and never be seen again. Time to talk about life problems and paint fish together. The only reason that you got wet today was because I was late getting there. A perfect transition. So get this, guys. This is Mitch's party. Yeah, I don't know. He invited everyone there to celebrate his promotion or something? He's just a party dude. Forget about forced retirement, Shawnee's freeze-up during a rescue, Craig's psychotic stalker, or Trevor's amazing Aussie brew. It's time to party like it's 1989. There's Mitch's greatest friend, dude in the background with the conch shell. Check out his dancing. Wait, how did Crazy Lady know about Mitch's party? Were there flyers? Hey Hobie, hand these out on the beach. Tell all your friends what a cool dude I am. Meanwhile, the show begins to set up Shawnee and Eddie's romance, arguably one of the more unrealistic elements of the show. And all you California girls think about, huh? Having a good time? Well, it's better than brooding off by yourself. <laughs> oh yeah, they keep trying to tell us how broody Eddie is. What a dark lone wolf. Why does everyone around here think because we work together we should be one big happy family? I don't need another family, okay? I don't have a family and that makes me mysterious. That six-year-old didn't get my joke. <laughs> Later that night, Jiffy Pop calls up Craig and says if he doesn't meet her, she'll kill herself. Is he your father? I didn't want him to get in bed with me again. Um, Shooting a little high, don't you think, Baywatch? Your greatest villain right now is an Australian woman chaser with virgin converter business cards. I'm not sure you should try to handle something like this. So this leads Craig and his wife Gina to invite her to stay with them. I want to just go there in the morning unannounced. I'll call Child Protective Services after that. Forget calling the authorities first. I'm a lifeguard. He shows up at her house and finds out that her father died ten years ago. She just gotten released from the hospital and has a history of hurting herself and making up stories. So they're not really handling a molestation plot. She's actually a psychotic self-harmer. Now it's lighthearted! Jiffy Pop's clever ruse has fooled Gina into going under the pier with her, where she's sneakily hidden a knife away in her fanny pack of murder. Oh, oh man, guys, I just got it. This is the panic at Malibu Pier! As a side note, is it really called Malibu Pier? Was Ocean Pier too broad? Also, yes, it's really called Malibu Pier. Luckily, Craig is on his way- wait, 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 wait. Does his license plate seriously say swim or die? Baywatch, you little shits. Ah, bomb scare! It's our fate! As we all know, Craig doesn't believe in fate, so he gets the knife away from Jiffy Pop and saves the day, thus bringing the movie to a somewhat downbeat conclusion. Fifteen minutes left of the movie! By now, you're probably wondering how this is supposed to end. 
After all, this isn't just a pilot, it's also a movie, and they've sort of already reached the climax with the psychotic stalker plot. Well, I'll tell you. A fisherman has a horrible propane-based grill accident. Eh, well, he probably made it. As entertaining as seeing fishermen reduced to smoldering corpses is, we need a little bit more investment. So it turns out Hobie and Lifeguard Day Before Retirement are on the same boat. Look at all these explosions, damn! How much propane was on that ship? Things look dire, but luckily the rescue crew is on the way. Johnny, you alright? I forgot everything we learned! Uh, maybe just leave this one up to Noomi, guys. Part of the boat is capsized, leaving Hobie and a couple of other people trapped under the water. Luckily, they have the show's favorite life-saving measure, a convenient air pocket. Mitch and Lifeguard Day Before Retirement manage to get them out, but LDBR ends up trapped in some rope. He doesn't reach the surface in time and passes away. No, but it was the day before his retirement! Only death can retire, whatever the hell my real name was. <sighs> They hold an honorary lifeguard funeral for him, and Mitch makes a speech over a muffled loudspeaker about how many saves he's had because of lifeguard day before death. Unfortunately for Hobie, Mitch dressed him that day. You know, Al told me recently that being underwater was like floating in liquid heaven. So in a way, I guess he was already in heaven when he died. No, I was drowning to death, you asshole! And we'll never forget you. Or ever stop loving you. Never gonna give you up. Never gonna let you down. Never gonna run around and desert you. <laughs> I was addicted the whole time. Thus, the movie is brought to an extremely downbeat conclusion. Three minute beach montage! Probably because someone just horribly died. Man, that really means something, I tell you. So for a pilot movie, this is honestly... okay. It has some moments where you have to suspend your disbelief a bit, but no more so than a lot of other television programs. It's interesting to see it now and compare it with the show in the later seasons. Speaking of which, we've got a hell of a long way to go. So if you enjoyed this blast from the past, I hope you can kick back, relax, and enjoy the ride. Next time on Baywatch. The show attempts to make us care about Hobie and his friends, but will they succeed? Plus, Garner Ellerby makes his explosive debut. Meanwhile, Eddie is homeless and probably smells. <laughs> Be sure to tune in!